Hey YouTube, it's JP Dillon. Welcome to part 3 of the 1959 Philco Predictive Princess Service and Repair. On today's episode, our goal is to get this board up and out of the machine so that we can be begin more meticulous cleaning of it, repopulating of the miniature tube sockets which have a tendency to fail, uh, capacitors, and work on uh, gathering information to build the couplets. Now, the nice thing is, is that many of these are labeled so that you can put them back into the proper positions they were. And so, what I typically will do is I will label each wire before I take it loose. And so that way there's no difficulty as to where it went. And then once you get those taken care of, then these little ground pads at the end, you desolder them to release the board. They're all at the corners. There's one in the middle, uh, actually two in the middle. And then you lift the board out and free of everything else, and then we can begin work on it. So we're going to label all these, take the tubes out, and then uh, attempt to remove the board. Okay, so as you can see, everything's now been labeled. <clears throat> These two tubes are really stuck in here, and I'm really afraid that I'm going to break them trying to get them out. So i got to get some uh, fader lube in the socket somehow to loosen the pins up. In case you're curious, the time that it took to do all of this, label each and every one of these and unwire wrap it from each post, was about an hour. So a lot of time goes into prep work for taking this board out. So all I've got to do now is desolder all the little ground straps and bend away the thingy down there, a couple of those that are holding the board in. And then we can get this bad boy out and we can see uh, what needs to be cleaned up and done next. Because it's not easy. You can't. It's not like you can just lift up the bottom and get to everything on the board. You can see there's very few access points there. So that's something to consider when working on one of these is you really have to be thorough. Servicing one of these from the top is the uh, the way to create frustrations and things because you can't see about 80% of the rest of the board, so you don't know what you're missing. But uh, definitely, these two sockets probably have some corrosion on them, and that's why they're holding the pins in. This one was really sloppy. Uh, that one had some slop in it, too. Those miniature sockets are notorious for death. So we've got some really high-quality ones to put in their place. And then you got to check all the resistors because the, especially the high value ones like, you know, 10 meg, 12 meg, etc. They, they go way out there and then the set doesn't quite work, work right, particularly in the AGC section and IF section. So, yeah, let's get to pulling the board up and then we can see what lovely things await us next. Okie dokie. And the main PCB is out. And here it is, completely removed. You can see now that it's actually quite small and simple. The wiring harnesses definitely make it look very intimidating. So if we go to the underside, you can definitely tell by the discoloration here where all the heat buildup is around the horizontal and the damper. So if you look closely, you can see that the soldering on those is very oxidized, very poor condition. And that definitely all needs attention. We're going to be doing a, a lot of resoldering here. This has been repaired a number of times over the years. Um, here's our little couple of things here and there. The ones back there, they're going to need to be replaced. I still need to get these tubes loose because they are stuck in there. And I don't want to break them if I don't have to. And technically, this is the correct view of the board since all the text would then be upright. You gotta hope that little coils and stuff like that don't get injured. Uh, all these little peaking coils, like stuff like this over here, they all have to get ohmed out, make sure that they're happy because you don't want to take the time to take this thing apart and miss something like that only to have to pull the board out again. So you want to be absolutely thorough 
and then there's our little horizontal phase detector diode that's common to fail we got to get rid of that I think these are the potentiometers that get the tin whiskers in them it's hard to tell from this vantage where that is might get them under some magnification but hey the board's out so let the real fun begin and now we have the board cleaned up uh, basically what I did was uh, took some simple green and distilled water mixture and uh, let the board soak a little bit while avoiding the coils and the IF and the transformers there uh, and then uh, washed everything down with uh, CRC QD which does a really good job of uh, displacing all of the board cleaner and water but it's really cleaned up now and now it's time to work on repopulating things and most notably the biggest issue on these is the miniature sockets uh, somebody had actually dribbled solder into these sockets to make the pins crimp tighter and that kind of hurt the sockets uh, but I got replacements for those and we definitely have to do some resoldering on this board but it's a good place to start and we'll replace all the capacitors now I thought about building K networks um, but there's actually a guy in the uh, community um, who we'll talk about in the next video because uh, stuff hasn't arrived yet but he makes brand new couplets uh, to replace these guys here and for the amount of money you spend on an entire set is a fraction of the money in my time that I would have to take to build them all and they're molded and they look like the factory part and they're stamped like the factory part and they just are drop-ins so, but we'll discuss that in the next video. Right now, let's take a look at the sockets we got. Alright, so on your left is the 7-pin sockets. Um, these I got from Apex Jr., uh, a.k.a. Steve Slater, who's in the Torrance area. Uh, he provides access to a lot of replacement parts like this in the electronic world. Um, he's got a website uh, i think he's also got an ebay store somewhere but the website is apexjr.com and then the nine pin miniature here um, i ended up getting from uh, vintage electron incorporated which is based out of new hampshire um, but the reason why i got these two sockets is because they're ceramic they're going to withstand the heat better they're going to hold up better under stress you also have to pay attention to how the pins are. You see how these pins splay outward like this? You need to have the ones that splay outward like this because uh, the ones that you get where the pins are straight right out of the bottom of the socket will not work in this board because of the placement of the pins. And if you just line it up here, you can see that these pins fit almost perfectly. I think it'll focus for me. So I'm not going to have to fight that one. Um, same with the miniature socket. Uh, the little miniature guy over here. Yeah, for the sound detector too. But I can just go over here and line up the pins willy-nilly and it's going to be minimal effort to get these things in here, which is good. Uh, because, yeah, just want it to be straightforward. Now the only place that it gets a little tricky is with the tube shields. Uh, with the pull up one here, we may have to create extensions to go around the socket depending on whether we can get them around the little uh, divots there or not. And these other ones that are just soldered to the board are just expanding ones so we can expand them a little bit and fit them around the socket to work for the shielding. So that's probably the least of our issues. So just uh, at first, we're going to do these two 9-pin sockets here for the vertical and the audio. Uh, and I'll just show you the difference. 
we'll swap out the one for the audio first and you can see when I'm done what the difference is and what it looks like and it's just a much better style socket there are ones that these are plastic ones uh, they're not great but they're not as bad as the phenolic ones there I've seen ones that are phenolic that absolutely crumble and don't bite down although these ones are kind of sloppy uh, and the guy that put solder in the socket pins that yeah uh, nope I would never do that just replace the socket but then again he would have had to take the board up and that would have been time and effort and money that probably back then they didn't want to spend so let me swap that socket real fast and I'll show you the difference okay well there it is this was a fairly easy install um, really wish that we could get a better exposure on this that works a little better the reflection off the white is maxing out the camera there and I also discovered how brittle this board really is because even as so much as wiggling the old socket in and out uh, caused a little hairline crack there so I had to jumper that and just for grins and giggles made sure that anything that might have been uh, through the crack got jumpers so got to be really careful with these old boards this one's a lot more fragile than I had originally anticipated but you can see the quality of the socket and there's the old one which is plasticky and brittle and then you got the new one there which is a nice ceramic uh, that'll last significantly longer than its predecessor um, so I'm going to change the other sockets including the ones with the shields on them which might get a little tricky but we'll figure out a way to make that work and then we'll go on to uh, recapping the thing replacing the phase detector diode uh, and then definitely uh, gonna have to wait for the couplets to get here but that's you know that's not a big deal but we'll discuss that later and FYI when you're making the installation of these tube sockets make sure to bend down the pins you see how I bend them away here and the reason why I do that is to make a better stronger mechanical connection I just push the socket from the other side and bend them down as far as they go so that way there's very little chance that even if a solder gets loose the pins gonna to come totally out of position and there's the seven pin all soldered in and there's what it looks like from the top and the tube shield just has two points where it solders into so we can just place that over top of the tube socket like that and then we'll solder the uh, socket shield in okay so we got that soldered in there and from the bottom everything looks cool there all right that looks a little sketch. Maybe we'll retouch that up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, much better. All right, on to the next one. Another FYI, more about board brittleness. When you get these things unsoldered, these old sockets, make sure to cut the little center crimp. You see how this one here is soldered? This one isn't soldered, but it's still squeezed and crimped to make it hard to get out. So I cut it and then I cut the edges that are splayed out it makes it a lot easier to get out and you will need to very carefully get underneath and pry at all the corners just real slow real gentle don't try to rush this process if you do you'll just end up with a headache but you can see it's coming up and we're just going to do it from all sides until the socket comes up you don't want to apply too much force if you have to apply too much force you're going to crack the board so like this side's not wanting to cooperate for whatever reason there's like one or two pins that are hanging on now it's starting to come out and finally it comes out but just go real slow with this if you're trying this on your own go real slow because if you don't and you end up busting the board you just create more work for yourself because now you got to fix all those broken connections you just created and then the new socket is more or less just got to get the pins lined up 
and they drop in. That's why you get the ones with the pins that are splayed out, because it just works. And then you bend the pins over on the other side, and I still hold it from the top while I initially solder it, just to make sure there's no possible way that any sort of physical forces are going to peel up the foil traces underneath. So, but yeah, that's, that's changing the socket on these. All right, so we got that guy soldered in. He was the vertical lap, but... So, we have three sockets in so far and we've got three left we've got <clears throat> the horizontal oscillator uh, we've got our video output over here and I forget what you are you are an AGC or something like that I forget anyways these well this one is a soldering type shield that's gonna be easy this one this is the one I worry about uh, let's do this one next so I can just show you the whole thing about the expanding shield because it's integral with the socket well i can't say integral because it's just kind of clamped on from the bottom but the center pin there goes to the shield which then solders in from the bottom so we need to figure out a way to incorporate that and not destroy it because i am going to need it with the next socket uh, it's a bit of a pain so let's do that one next just because that that one's the hard one Okay, I desoldered that guy and squeezed the center pin best I can here, so we're going to try to take all this out as one piece. Okay, so they separated, but that's probably okay. I can make this work. But you can see the grounding strap for the shield goes around via the key, that rivet there. It's riveted to there, and then that solders to the board. So, and this did crack the board up a little bit when I tried to take it loose. So we got a little bit of repair work to do down here. You can see that came out pretty bad. So we need to fix that. Uh, this thing was just fighting me the whole way. Even though I had pinched it down the best I could uh, and removed all the solder and everything, it still injured the board a bit. So I'm gonna find a way to uh, shore this up because there's some damage there. Seal it with epoxy and then we'll put the new socket in and attach the shield to the socket and then to the ground. Okay, so here's where we're at with our socket shield combo. Uh, so I've got it crimped on here, but that's not gonna hold it. So what I'm gonna do is run a solid gauge wire around the perimeter right underneath here, right up against where I've got the little fingers crimped you can see. And what we're going to do then is tighten that ring and solder to the ring and then provide a ground strap to go to the board from there. So it not only provides physical reinforcement for the shield to keep it there, but it also provides our grounding that we need. So that's going to be a little tricky, but uh, I think that we can do that no problem. Okay, so here's the finished product. And you can see what I've done is I've put hard wire around the under lip of the socket and then solder the pins of the shield to that ring and then we've made a center lead for the ground of that ring so this way the shield isn't going to go anywhere and it's still expandable and everything and works with the socket so that's what we're going to do to put that in there and I'm going to do some board repair on this shore it up solder jumpers and then go from there Okay, so you can see the jumpers I've made. I've uh, shored up the damage. I'm going to rough it and seal it with epoxy uh, to make sure that it's not going to weaken again. But there you can see, there's our socket with our expanding tube shield. And so that way we don't have to compromise that feature. The tube shield's firm on there. It's centered in there. Uh, so not an issue. So that was the hard one at least. This one just solders in adjacent. This was just a bare socket. So we can let's do uh, let's do this guy next, and just take the old one out, and put another one in. Cool. So that one came out nice and easy. And again, this is just soldering tube shield. So it's just a matter of taking the next socket, popping it in there, and then. Once it's soldered up, we'll uh, mount the tube shield around it. 
And of course, now that I've said that, it's going to be incredibly difficult to get this thing in here. I'm sure. There we go. So, that's in there. Solder that guy up. And then we should be good. Alrighty. Okie dokie. So we got that bad boy soldered in with the shield on. Looking good. No sacrificial board damage there. So now we're on to this guy. And then we'll be done with the miniature sockets. And then we can start focusing on more important things like capacitors and out of tolerance resistors and stuff. Cool. That one came up nice and easy. No damage there. Let's stick a new socket in. All right, so new sockets in. Board's all soldered up. So we got the socket part down. Our nice fresh miniature sockets there. Gonna provide a good connection for the tube. A lot longer lasting being they're ceramic versus plastic or phenolic. So that, that part is done. What we need to focus on now is checking over all these resistors, particularly the, the high value ones, like the you know 150k, uh, one megs, 2.2 megs, stuff like that. Those all have a tendency to drift way upward, and that will impact performance. Uh, then double check and ohm out all these coils again. Make sure we didn't ding any or knock any uh, out of continuity. And we'll re start replacing capacitors. And then once we do that, um, then all that's left really is to install the uh, couplets networks and the horizontal phase detector diode. This doesn't appear to have any tin whiskers on it. Uh, just zooming way in here. If it'll do that for me. Hello. Nope, I don't want to change exposure. I just want to zoom. There we go. Uh, it does. It's got the little fuzzies. So I'm probably going to have to take this out. Very carefully take it apart and clean it. And at the very least paint the housing. So that the little tin whiskers don't propagate into the potentiometers and cause all sorts of fun. But yeah, so far we're doing pretty good here. So... Uh, now it's just a matter of checking over resistors, replacing caps, etc. So that'll be next. All right, so now that we got the sockets out of the way, I want to focus on getting this recapped and checking for out of tolerance resistors, uh, particularly ones that are really high in value to begin with. Um, like 1.5 meg will usually go up, 3.3 meg will usually go up. So down here is a 3.9 meg, and that's rated under, so it's probably re reading through the circuit. Just all these really high value ones. Yeah, so this one's uh, 6,800, it's reading 65, or excuse me, 60, 680,000, it's reading 650,000. 40, it's reading 56k, it's supposed to be a 47k, so let me put a little dot next to that one, because that one's obviously way out. Now let's see, here's another one there, it should be 56 ohms, it's 69 ohms, so that one's out. I'm just putting little red dots next to them. 680 reading 815 so that one's out all these have got to get changed let's see here's a 390 that's like a cathode resistor 420 that's right at the 10% uh, mark I think let's say it's four 400 so it's less than 10% off it's not going to do anything Drift-O-Matic resistors. That one reads good. 1.8 meg reading 680. So that's probably in circuit there. 
yeah, 400, 680 reading, 460 is all right. Uh, let's see here, 2.2 .2 meg, yeah, it's reading under. If it reads under, that means you're usually reading through a circuit. And this is uh, 1, 2, and 10 to the 5th, so that should be 12 meg. That's a little high, 14 meg. Yeah, no, it's a, that's a little more than 10%. So we'll just put a dot after that one too. And then uh, let's see here. 1.8 meg reading 1.6. 150 K reading 160. That's, eh, that's on the cusp. Just might as well change it. Usually if it's more than 10%, I'll change them out. There's a 10K, reading almost 13. So that one's going to go. And let's see. 12K, reading 7, it's pretty good. What is that supposed to be? Oh, 6.8K. Yeah, that's reading okay. But you get the idea here. So I'm just going to continue to read these guys. 490 out of 470. That should, yeah, that should probably go. A little more than 10%. Let's see, you're a four, you're a 730, 70, what are we at? If I can get it to read right. Yeah, 4.3K. Got those. 150 ohm. That one's got to get changed. It's reading 175. Looks like this has been replaced because this is a metal film style. 15, it's supposed to be 22. And uh, let's see, 6.8 or 8 point, no, 6.8, so that's right on the money. It's this one standing up here. That's a 22K. Here's the bottom side of it, here's the top side of it. That's reading all right. So this has been serviced over the years because there have been parts changed out. 10K reading 11.4. That's about the 10% mark. Uh, the way these circuits are designed, 10% is totally permissible. You could probably be up to 20, but usually over 10 and I change them. So let's see. You are a... 56, reading 59, so you're okay. You look like a 1K. 1.1, yeah, you're you're still alive there. Did I already do these? I don't know if I did or not. 460, that's a 560, so that's good. So you're 18 meg reading 600. Okay, I already did those ones. All right. There's 100K reading 113. It's a little bit high. It's 13% high. And like I said, you could probably leave these in here and the set would still function. But there's a 15 reading 14. 180 reading... 230, so that's got to go. A lot of resistors to change out. You're a 1.8 reading 1.7. Let's see, here's another 100 reading 118. You're a little high. 
100k. That's within 5%, so that's good. Here's a 33k reading 36. That's about within the 10% mark. Here's another 12, uh, 12 meg reading 15. It's a little high. Now let's see, here's another 100k, reading 107, I already read that one and that one, let's come back here, 680, reading 880, so that's a little high. And let's see, here's another 100. 130, it's a little high. I'm going to have to make a big old list of these things. And then the one hiding back here in the corner. 270, reading 326, so you're high. Okay, so we got a lot of resistors to change so far. And then there's all the fancy film capacitors to change out. Um, I'm just going to make a quick list here <clears throat> of where they are and where they go, and then we'll change them. Okay, so there's the rough map. The only one I couldn't see from the top is this guy, so there's no value for him yet. I'm going to pull him first and then take the uh, value of that down. Alright, so I got him to the solder. Let's yank him out. Let's see what this actually is. So that's a double lot six eight. Let me just write that down. All right, so that's our list. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull these parts and get to changing them. All right. So, I got all the remaining caps that I need to pull in red. And we're just going to desolder them from the board like we do with everything else and get them ready. And that way we can just pop the old ones out, pop the new ones in, and then solder the board up. That makes things so much nicer. It's the only thing I like about circuit boards is the ease of that. But, uh... Really, circuit boards and tube gear don't mix. The heat just kills everything, as we've seen so far. This board is incredibly fragile. So this set definitely had a lot of hours on it. Because normally they're, they're pretty crappy circuit boards, but they also, uh, their life is entirely dependent on how much they've been used and how well they've been ventilated. And this set was definitely a high hour set. Especially considering the picture tube in it was just wasted. Uh, you don't normally see them so dead that they don't even register, so. I'm just desoldering these one by one. Keep having to recenter the camera and the board. Because I have a tendency to move around the equipment, and very little do I move the equipment around me, which is probably a stupid practice, but that's how I've done it all this time. And every once in a while, I gotta trim off my wick because. This stuff is really good. This Chemwick solder, uh, solder wick really gets the stuff up and off the board really fast and really thorough, which is good because that lessens the time that you have to have the heat on it.
I'd love to get me one of those fancy dancy induction solderers. But that's money I do not have. And probably won't for some time. I don't know if it's factory to have the horizontal AFC diodes in a plug-in socket. I've never seen that on one of these before, so either somebody added it or I'm just full of it and wasn't paying attention the last couple times I worked on these. So there I go again moving the board. Hope I'm getting this right. We'll find out, won't we? I usually have pretty good spatial perception between what's on the top of the board and the bottom of the board, but we'll certainly find out once we get it all apart. I got a lot of people asking me why there aren't more folks doing this sort of work. and This is largely the reason why. It's because it's very tedious, mundane, boring work having to rework these boards. And most people just don't want to do that. Like me, I like the troubleshooting aspect of this work more so than I do rebuilding boards. And a lot of people don't value that skill, and they don't want to pay the amount of money that people ask for that. And so the number of people that do this just keeps getting less and less over time until there isn't any more. Now another thing that bothers me is the people that don't want to pass on the skill. They don't want to pass on the skill. And so the younger generations can't learn how to do this, and the skill just dies. Now, when I was learning how to do this, that's all we had. We didn't have the internet, we didn't have people to share their knowledge unless they were nearby. And thankfully, I was lucky enough to grow up around people who had been in the fields. Uh... I knew people who were radar technicians, radio repairmen, electronic techs in the Navy, uh, and they all taught me how to do this stuff. I mean, yeah, I read lots of books and things, but that only goes so far. You really have to apply your knowledge. Let's see if that helps me at all. Yep, all right, so that one came up. Always one that wants to fight you. All right, that guy came up. And we got this guy, yep, I decided the wrong spot is supposed to be here. We got, well, I put that double lot 6.8 in here. <clears throat> I did take this one loose.
And I know it's an orange drop, but I'm going to replace it anyways. Orange drops rarely die. And I'm also going to redo the work that I did on this point one here that I tacked in for testing purposes. Did I not do this one yet? Nope, I did not. Let's mark this one. The one that I neglected. Now the resistors will get changed out when the couplets do because I don't have some of those values on hand like the 15 mega I'm pretty sure I don't have on hand. So I'm going to have to order those and that will take a little bit. Yeah, see how that solder oxidized and didn't hold? That's why I don't like tack soldering stuff from above. It just doesn't work as well. And I gotta do this one on the underside anyways. But for testing purposes, it was all right. Okay. So we got all the caps out now it's just really a matter of repopulating let me solder this uh, double lot 6 8 in here before I forget and end up popping it out here And we'll just put the rest of them in, and we'll solder it all up. All right, so we've got the board recapped. Uh, I'm using these Panasonic 105-degree uh, 10% uh, film caps. And you can see I had to parallel a couple to get a few values. But the board's all soldered up. And it's looking pretty good. So I'm really happy with where this is at right now. As soon as the resistors and the couplets come in, then we'll go about replacing those. And then uh, we'll check all the coils and everything, make sure they're happy. And so hopefully the end result will be a bore that we can just put back in. And I am going to attempt to, uh, at the very least, clean and repaint these controls the housing of which uh, starting to get the little tin whiskers, so we don't want that. But all in all, that's where we're at so far. I'm about out of space on the camera, so we're going to wrap up this episode. But stay tuned for the next, when we uh, hopefully get the resistors and couplets put in and do some final checks before we get ready to pop this back in the chassis. So anyways, thanks for watching. More stuff to come.